Well, hello everyone from Minneapolis. Uh, I'm Santiago Garcia. I'm one of the moderators of ACTIS, our Adult Congenital Interventional Symposium for CVI 2020. Uh, to my right is Dr. Kelly Han, my co-moderator. Kelly. Hello everyone. We're very excited to have this first congenital session and hopefully it'll be a recurring uh, theme. We have some great uh, speakers that have wonderful expertise in the pulmonary valve space. And so we'll go ahead and get started. Please go ahead and start the first talk. So thank you uh, for listening to the Adult Congenital Transcatheter Intervention Symposium. This is going to be an overview of pulmonary valve dysfunction and indications for intervention in adult congenital heart disease and is the first of four lectures looking at structural intervention in the pulmonary valve space. I do get grant funding from Siemens and the John DeHaan Foundation. So everybody knows that congenital heart disease is now an adult problem. In the current era, 80% of patients with congenital heart disease are adults and 15 to 20% are above the age of 60. For the first time ever, patients have the opportunity to live long enough to have both acquired and congenital heart disease in the same patient. This is looking at intervention in adult congenital heart disease and this is data from England. And in this 20 year period, there was a threefold increase in procedures in all congenital patients the largest increase was in adult patients, and 75% of those were valve related. And of those, pulmonary valve replacement is the most common. Pulmonary valve dysfunction can happen in conduits placed as part of an initial repair in patients with pulmonary atresia, absent pulmonary valve after a stellar nocardial procedure. And pulmonary valve dysfunction uh, can also occur after transannular patch in intervention in the right conduct alpha tract as part of repair of tetralogy, transposition, um, or a pulmonary valvuloplasty for pulmonary stenosis. The risk factors for re-intervention is a young age at the initial um, intervention, the number of previous conduits that the conduit was placed, and also if there's high pulmonary pressures or distal obstruction, uh, that can also increase the chance of needing a conduit. This is looking at outcomes for surgical pulmonary valve replacements in children. The most important part of this slide is looking at the graph on the bottom left, and you can see that 10 to 15 years out, almost every patient has pulmonary valve dysfunction or has had a conduit replacement. And so for patients having these right particular upper tract conduits, um, it's not really a question of if the valve will need to be replaced, but when, how, and how many times. Looking at pulmonary valve replacement, it is the most common um, congenital heart disease procedure. This article from The Lancet was the first time a percutaneous pulmonary valve was reported by Dr. Bonhoeffer in the year 2000. The sapien valve has been used in the pulmonary space since 2005. And the current state is that two thirds of pulmonary valve replacements are surgical and about one third are percutaneous. And the current limitations are the need for other surgery, which is uh, true in about 25% of patients. If you have a large RVOT that's too big for the currently available valves, although that is changing with the um, Altera and the Harmony, and also uh, coronary compression concerns, which we'll talk about. So looking at the indications for a pulmonary valve replacement in adult congenital heart disease, and it really uh, started with tetralogy of flow, but it, it translates to uh, all the other diseases uh, for which there is right ventricular alpha tract dysfunction. So a high right ventricular and diastolic volume, a high right ventricular and systolic volume, uh, right ventricular dysfunction, pulmonary stenosis, pulmonary insufficiency, uh, arrhythmia, and then also symptoms is one of the most important things in addition to decreased um, exercise tolerance on cardiopulmonary tests. This is looking at the criteria that were used in the clinical trials for the Melody and the Sapien valves. And again, it was looking at um, conduit dysfunction mean gradient over 35 or more than moderate pulmonary insufficiency, and then patients that were classified as um, symptomatic as well. In looking at a lot of these patients, though, there is very strict criteria for pulmonary stenosis versus pulmonary insufficiency, and a lot of patients really do have uh, mixed valve dysfunction and may not meet strict criteria for one of those. And putting a new pulmonary valve really does uh, help the RV recover. And so looking at the bottom right, uh, New York Heart Association class patients feel better. And if you look at their right ventricular diastolic volumes and their um, ejection fraction, our right to left ventricular ratio, the right ventricles usually do recover using the current criteria for pulmonary valve placement. This is from the 2018 guidelines for adult congenital heart disease. And the first thing is if you have um, severely decreased right or left ventricular systolic function, it may be that transplant and advanced heart therapies are needed rather than a valve replacement, and this is an important point. For those that do have a lot of pulmonary insufficiency, if you are symptomatic, it's a class one indication for intervention. And if you're not symptomatic, really uh, as a matter of right ventricular dysfunction, left ventricular dysfunction, the amount of RV dilation um, is the need for a valve. 
This is um, some new data that has come out from Dr. Anne Marie Valenti, who's done some excellent work in patients with Tetralogy of Fallot uh, in long-term follow-up. This is actually looking at uh, 452 patients who had a pulmonary valve replacement in a median of 25 years of age. And this is out of uh, the indicator cohort, which they're following over 1,400 patients long-term with Tetralogy of Fallot. In a median follow-up of 6.5 years, 17% of patients had a primary or secondary outcome, which included death, resuscitated death, sustained VTAC, atrial arrhythmias, and heart failure. And so using the current criteria, we still have a high rate of adverse events in these patients over a relatively short time period. Looking at the risk factors for this, um, over here you can see that if your right ventricular ejection fraction is low, that you have a much higher risk of adverse event. If you have a mass to volume ratio over 45, which is an indicator of pulmonary pressures in right ventricular hypertrophy, and also if you are older. Other things um, that were important were a BMI over 30, a chromosome abnormality, and then interestingly, MRI and diastolic volume of pulmonary insufficiency were not associated with outcome. And so a lot of our criteria are based on volumes right ventricle, which really don't predict some of the adverse events, although it does seem to predict our recovery. In looking at the combined outcomes of um, death, resuscitated sudden death, and VTAC, if you have more than, um, if you have, if you're younger, if you have a normal right ventricular ejection fraction and you don't have RVH, your chance of having an adverse event is fairly low, where if you have two or more of those things, your chance of an adverse event is uh, significantly increased. And if you look at primary and secondary outcomes and you add pre-pulmonary valve atrial flutter fibrillation and the end systolic volume, uh, your chance of having an adverse event with those present is also much higher. And so these are the, start, the things we need to start looking at in addition to the volumes and the pulmonary insufficiency and the standard imaging things we've been using in the past. Now, when you're imaging for a percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement, um, as I said, the recommendations a lot of times are for pure pulmonary insufficiency or pure pulmonary stenosis, and so it's much more nuanced when you have mixed pulmonary valve dysfunction. And looking at the high rate of adverse events, we probably need to go earlier in some of our patients. And a multimodality assessment is really essential for complete evaluation. We need to look at the pulmonary stenosis gradient, the amount of pulmonary insufficiency, how the function of the right ventricle or the tricuspid valve is. And for the right ventricle, it's important to index it to BM to height if with a high BMI or we'll be putting the valves in uh, too late. The other thing I think is important for patients that have um, pulmonary infusion and tract ventricular septum is the right atrial and IVC size since the directly portion of the right ventricle might be uh, morphologically abnormal and not able to dilate. Both MRI and CT can quantify uh, ventricular volumes equivalently. There's many studies that have shown that. And you can use stroke volume differences to assess PI from the CT data set if you're very careful with echo correlation. And this is one study, I think, that shows that fairly well. So this is actually an MRI study. And what they looked at was the correlation of right ventricular stroke volume to flows by main pulmonary artery. In experienced people who do a lot of right ventricular work, the correlation was 0.97 for RV stroke volume and main pulmonary artery flow. And the same was true for left ventricular stroke volume versus aortic flow. And so if you're doing a cardiac CT and you have very accurate stroke volume differences and you can correlate to echo, you can use that for quantification of your pulmonary insufficiency shunt. Looking at coronary anatomy and percutaneous valves, there is uh, a risk for coronary compression and some adverse events um, earlier in the transcatheter valve um, experience. And so uh, looking at 404 patients, 85% um, had valve implantation, 5% had uh, evidence of coronary compression, 17% had an abnormal coronary pattern, and of those with coronary compression, 71% had an abnormal coronary pattern. And so it's very important to be looking for that as we screen patients for percutaneous valves. This is actually just some examples of coronary artery um, relationship to the sternum, which I think is important. Also, um, the relationship of the coronary artery to the right ventricular outflow tract. And here you can see in transposition, the coronary coursing anterior to the outflow tract. You can also see in enlarged aortas, there um, can be issues of compression between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And then also with calcified conduits and stents, I think that um, the relationship uh, is important to be able to predict who you think may or may not have coronary compression. This is looking at um, imaging of a coronary artery in a patient with a previously placed pulmonary conduit. And I think um, some of the things that predict coronary compression in addition to anomalies is a high origin of the coronary artery where it's coursing um, along the RVOT. And then this patient does not have this, but I think if the coronary comes out in between the artery and the pulmonary artery, those are two things I think that together would predict a fairly high instance of, of coronary compression. The other thing that I think is good to know is where your calcification is, and that can help in terms of where um, your conduit is most likely to rupture, and it also can help with uh, your anchor points for the valve.
In looking at the native right frontal alpha tract, I think it's very different. I think that there's three different uh, things that happen. One is a circumferential pulsatility, or the difference in the diameter and the area between systole and diastole, which can be up to 40% in some patients, and our patients an average of 26%. There also is eccentricity, where you don't have an oval annulus, and there also is what we call longitudinal shortening in some of these patients. And I think this information is important for predicting the ability to place a valve in the native right ventricular alpha. Here's an example of uh, pretty extreme pulsatility of a native right ventricular alpha tract. And in this case, the difference between systole and diastole is uh, almost 45%. And so getting a four-dimensional data set, whether it's CT or MRI, can be helpful in predicting um, and planning for percutaneous valves in these patients. So I think in summarizing imaging and indications for pulmonary artery replacement, uh, the current criteria predict RV recovery. The current criteria do not predict ventricular tachycardia, death, and uh, congestive heart failure, and so we may be getting more aggressive in the future. Many patients have mixed valve dysfunction, and so they may not meet strict criteria based on uh, purely PI or PS. With a high BMI, I think you do need to index all the volumes to height in order to put a valve in at an appropriate time. And I really, uh, truly believe that a heart team concept is best for managing these patients. And this would include the expertise of your interventionalist, your adult congenital imager, your adult congenital cardiologist, and your surgeon. And I do think we have a lot to learn about planning for percutaneous intervention in the pulmonary space. And I look forward to hearing our next experts uh, talk. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you to the organizers for allowing me to present on the experience of the Melody Valve in conduit and native RV alpha tracks. These are my disclosures. The history of the Melody Valve is well known to most of us by now. The first implantation of what would become the Melody Valve was performed by Philip Bonhoeffer in 2000. It is a bovine jugular vein valve sewn into a platinum meridium stent frame and delivered with the ensemble delivery system to diameters of 18, 20, or 22 millimeters. It received HD designation in 2010 and PMA approval in 2015. This has been a very well studied valve, a combination of multicenter prospective studies, including the IDE, PAS, and post market surveillance study, as well as a multitude of multicenter retrospective analyses and longitudinal registries have been performed. Many different aspects of the, de of the device have been studied, including infective endocarditis risk, stent fracture risk long-term valve performance and coronary compression have all been studied. The 10-year follow-up of the original IDE cohort was recently completed and I will share those results with you today. A number of studies have combined the IDE, PAS, and PMSS cohorts to provide a powerful tool to examine different aspects of the Melody Valve experience. This is an example of a combined study analysis conducted by Amy Armstrong and colleagues looking at the effect of age and implant on time-related outcomes. What they found is that patients who underwent transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement at an earlier age, less than 12 years of age, had shorter freedom from RVOT dysfunction, reintervention, and explant as seen on the Kaplan-Meier curve. I'm not going to spend any time on the discussion of endocarditis as Dr. McElhaney will cover this in depth, but this study demonstrated that younger age and implant and higher post-implant RVOT obstruction were risk factors for endocarditis, which have been described elsewhere. Before we discuss the long-term follow-up data from the ID cohort, I wanted to briefly discuss native RVOT implants. This will be covered in greater detail by Drs. Morgan and Zahn. This is an area in which the melody valve is limited in large part by the narrow range of implanting diameters. The valve is not approved for native RVOT implant, but there have been a number of studies examining outcomes, 
and strategies for native uh, RVOT implant with the Melody Valve. A number of novel strategies have evolved to allow for native RVOT OT implants, which I'm showing here. This is an example of a study uh, describing branch pulmonary artery implants for native RVOT dysfunction. This study is the most complete and contemporary of the, looking at the acute results of the off-label use of the Melody Valve in the native RVOT, which was conducted by Mary Hunt Martin as part of the PHN Scholars Program. This is a multi-center uh, study, largely looking at patients with tetralogy, uh, who undergone transannular patch placement. As you can see, the success rate for implant was less than what has been traditionally described at 58%. The majority of patients underwent uh, pre-stent implantation prior to melody valve implantation, and pre-stent embolization occurred in six patients. A large number of patients did not go under implantation, the majority of which was related to large RVOT diameter, which you can see both uh, in the figure as well as in the table, demonstrating that uh, patients who did not undergo implantation tended to have larger uh, diameters and more ellipticity than patients who were able to undergo successful implantation. Additionally, aortic root compression, coronary artery compression uh, were also significant factors. These are the results of the 10-year follow-up from the Melody Valve ID clinical study. These data were first presented at SKY this past spring. Thank you to Dr. Tom Jones for sharing these slides with me. As you can see, patients were followed through 10 years with nearly 94% compliance at 10 years. Median follow-up for those implanted with a valve for greater than 24 hours was 8.4 years. Patients were initially followed through five years and were then offered the option to consent to follow up through 10 years. As you can see here, RBOT gradients reduced after implant and remained relatively constant through 10 years of follow-up. Importantly, subjects were censured if they underwent any surgical or catheter interventions other than a balloon angioplasty. Similarly, sustained reduction in pulmonary regurgitation was seen over time. Of those patients still being followed at 10 years, 97% had between none and mild pulmonary regurgitation. And this correlates with improved clinical status over the same time period. Freedom from TPV dysfunction, which was the primary endpoint of the study, was 54% at 10 years. You can see the composite score there. The majority of patients who met the criteria for TPV dysfunction underwent reintervention. When we compare TPV dysfunction stratified by age, it is apparent that adult patients have a statistically significant higher from freedom from dysfunction than younger patients. This is similar to the data that was demonstrated in the article by Drs. Armstrong and colleagues. By separating out the types of interventions, we see that at 10 years, 79% of patients were free from reoperation and 72% were free from catheter reintervention. These results align with contemporary long term surgical series with similar patient populations. As I stated earlier, I won't spend a great deal of time discussing endocarditis as Dr. McElhaney will, will dive into this area in great detail. However, I would like to demonstrate the results from this particular study. Uh, at 10-year follow-up, 81% of patients were free from TP, TPV-related endocarditis. The results show incidence rates of 2.96 per 100 patient years for any endocarditis cases and 2% per 100 patient years for TPV-related infection. Long-term follow-up for the Melody Valve uh, is excellent. This valve uh, represents the paradigm for transcatheter valve implantation. The study of valve performance has been multifaceted and extensive. The Melody Valve is limited in its application to the native RVOT and really is designed for circumferential conduits and bioprosthetic surgical valves. Long-term follow-up demonstrates excellent and stable valve function at 10 years. Annualized TPV-associated endocarditis risk of 
And based on the results of the 10-year follow-up, it is clear that the melody transcatheter pulmonary valve can successfully prolong the life of a surgical conduit or bioprosthetic valve. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you for this opportunity. Hi everybody, um, this is Gareth Morgan from University of Colorado. So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, using the Sapien valve in conduits and native output tracts. And the question I pose is, has we, have we reached the limit for this technology? So with repair of the trilogy of fallow and other related defects, most patients don't actually have discrete defined conduits and most patients have what we describe as native outflow tracts with patches across the valve and some of these can get really huge so the sizes of these outflow tracts can reach 40 50 60 millimeters due to the dilation which is as we know promoted by the the abnormal physiology that um, happens after repair of the trilogy of fallow so from our point of view in the u.s we don't have access to um the venous valve, which uh, you may hear about during this session, uh, which has been used in, in Europe in a CE trial and in various parts of Asia, we've used it compassionately in the US, but it's really not available. And the Harmony valve from Medtronic and the Altera system from Edwards are still in the trial phase. So what we need to do is think outside the box a little bit regarding using the valve technology that's available to us, using stentic techniques, such as the, con the sort of concept of Russian doll stenting, or stenting from the pulmonary artery back to the MPA to create landing zones, or indeed to use a hybrid approach um, to cinch down the right ventricular artery tract to allow a landing zone to be created for then implantation of a regular valve. So really at the moment, although the XT is the approved valve for the pulmonary position from Edwards, um, most places that are uh, affiliated to adult TAVR centers um, are using the S3 and indeed now the S3 Ultra. Uh, the sheaths that come with this and the sheaths that the Edwards rep will hand you are, are the um, beautifully named Commander Certitude, Retroflex, Novaflex, etc., which are great names, but from the point of view of the pulmonary position, really not designed for the pulmonary position, and in fact are terrible sheaths and delivery systems for the pulmonary position. Um, so therefore we again have to think outside the box to make this technology uh, work for us. We know from several studies that the uh, size of the S3 valves is um, quite generous and in fact with uh, using extra volume in the balloons of these valves we can get them up to significantly past their nominal diameter. So you can see here a study um, uh, from Germany a couple of years back which showed you can get up to 31 millimeters out of a 29 millimeter valve and that two millimeters can make a big difference when you're on the borderline um, between surgery and percutaneous valve implantation for an anxious patient. So the Altera stent, we'll talk about it a bit later in the session I'm sure, but really all that it's doing is creating that landing zone using a, um, a, a specifically designed stent to allow then secure implantation of the um, sapien valve inside it. So what it's really doing is making an irregular dilated blown out outflow tract into a um, defined um, circular outflow tract with a diameter that suits a 29 millimeter valve. So you can see here as we simply drop the valve inside the Onfas Altera. Now without that and um, when we talk about getting ready for the sapien and native outflow tract, the trend has been to pre-stent and this is really due to the difficult experience that everybody had with the um, melody valve where there was a high rate of fracture in this valve without the use of pre-stenting early on in the Melody experience. Now, we learned that lesson from the Melody valve, but unfortunately we just employed that lesson straight into the Sapien valve, despite the fact that the stent that's used for the S3 and the XT is probably the best, strongest, most um, resistant stent that's on the market. Um, so I think our, our you know, the, the historical reason to pre-stent was really due to the Melody valve and then people have become comfortable with it. Um, the sapien short and therefore the perception is that you get better stability by pre-stenting and also then long stenoses where the valve may well end up only opening up a part of the stenosis means that you can sometimes benefit from using a pre-stent to cover the entire length of stenosis.
um, rather than leave stenosis in front of and after the valve. But not to pre stent, well, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. The valve's not going to fracture. This valve does not fracture the pelvic position. I'd be very happy to hear of any case reports of anybody seeing um, the stent of a Edwards S3 or XT fracturing in the pulmonary position. Um, delivering it with the tips and techniques and technology that we now have should mean we can deploy the valve accurately in a short landing zone. When we place a stent, then we have to recross the stent with the valve delivery system. This can hold up the delivery system. It can also risk embolizing the pre-stent. And from my point of view overall, we end up just complicating the procedure by using a pre-stent unless we have a specific reason to use it. And we've looked at this in a little multi-center study that we published a year or so ago, um, where we looked at um, 61 cases where we didn't use a pre-stent and really got quite nice results. And this was from um, a group of centers in the US and Dublin. Um, so you can see here, no embolizations or migrations, no perivalve leak after the stent, um, after the valve had been implanted, uh, no stent fractures, obviously, um, and other complications that are very typical of um, the problems that we see. For example, tricuspid valve damage, which I don't think pre-stenting has got any impact on. Um, the need for a redo, which again, I don't think was related. So really the, the, the um, complications that we saw during this um, uh, retrospective trial were really nothing to do with the, the um, landing zone, they're really to do with the delivery system and the techniques that we have to go through to get valves up into the outflow tract. So from our point of view, when should we pre-stent for using the sapien? Um, and this really applies to either homograph stenosis, chondrous stenosis or the outflow tract. So for me it's when there's a stenosis that's equal to or longer to, than the fully expanded length of the valve. So when you're looking at a you know, 20, 25, 30 millimeter length of stenosis, then you really need to get a stent in there to open that up unless you're very lucky with a balloon. Um, I think if you get a split in the conduit that shows you've got extravasation that's not very localized, then you're really duty bound to use a covered stent to seal that. Um, and again, just to illustrate that point, I mean, from my point of view, um, when we place the valve in a short level of stenosis, we obliterate the stenosis. However, when the valve is placed in a long area of stenosis, you can see there can be stenosis before and after the valve. For the best way to deal with this is to pre-stent and then place the valve inside it. Now, key to anything we do with the sapien valve, and I think this is now pervasive through most centers in the US and Europe and beyond, is to use what we call the dry seal technique, which is not really a technique, but it's um, really use of a long gore dry seal sheath. So, uh, this slide's a bit outdated. It says it was developed over a year ago, but for several years now we've been using this. And it really bypasses the issues of having a raw valve going through the tricuspid valve. Or sorry, a raw mounted valve going through the tricuspid valve. Um, and really allows us to get up into the outflow track position very, very easily. So although it says you're 25 cases in our institution, 50 worldwide, we're probably up now to well over 100 dry seal cases in our institution and many, many hundred worldwide. And in fact, I think now people are really using this as the go-to technique for um, uh, sapient valve implantation. So the dry seal sheath is placed around the right heart into position across the RVOT over usually a lumbicoist wire. The valve is loaded in position on the balloon outside the body. So none of this nonsense of positioning the valve on the balloon in the IVC, which is a, a taver induced syndrome that we've all got into. So we put the valve on the balloon where it's supposed to be, slide it up the dry seal and deploy it directly in the target zone. Here's an example, pretty pulsatile, non-obstructed native outflow tract with a large sizing balloon. So this is one of these borderline cases where we're looking at a sort of 28 millimeter, um, if you can call that a waist, a little bit of a narrowing in the center of the balloon. Checking the coronaries of that uh, balloon up. Make the coronaries look fine. And then you can see here the valve mounted in position on the balloon. Um, and then we slide it just through the valve of the dry seal. Um, and that allows us Do you want me to get a little bit more like a sort of down the barrel kind of thing like this? See what you think's best. It's it's blue underneath so it doesn't look so bad. No, I'm just saying. I still have to get them. Okay, and, and try to keep your hands on the other side of the valve. Hang on, it's really bright. Can we try to change the show with something right down there? Oh, yes. 
Now, I think this is maybe what you want. Up and just cost it a time, so maybe only a minute left. I have to move on quickly. So, do you want me to get a little bit more like a that's Michael Ross, my previous partner, chatting to me as he was helping me out with this procedure? But I'm just gonna okay, let's just crack on a bit here. So, you can see here now over the wire, this is the here we go. And you can see this here now, fluoroscopy, the dry seals past any area of narrowing obstruction, certainly bad strikeouts with valve, and sliding up nicely into position. And then just checking position, you make some fine adjustments. Oh yes. Now. And then deploy the valve in place, and sometimes we put an additional pigtail catheter up in the RVUT just to make sure everything looks good. So if you can define a landing zone of less than 30 millimeter with a sizing balloon, then you don't need to pre-stent. Avoidance of pre-standing and using the dry seal technique combined significantly reduces the complexity, far fewer steps, lower radiation dose, etc., etc. And we've moved now to using intracardiac echo as our sole source of assessment of the valve for after the procedure. We don't do any angiography unless we're worried about uh, conduit rupture or whatnot. So deployment issues due to aortic delivery system and aortic mentality are solved with the dry seal sheath. The Altera promises a good platform for continuing the increasing scope of the S3 valve to compete with large self-expanding valves. Frame fracture is not an issue. Valve and valve may be limited due to valve rigidity, but who needs a 29 millimeter valve? And a valve and valve and valve and valve and valve at 29 millimeters may well be a possibility. And from my point of view, the Sapien has become the standard for balloon expandable pulmonary valve implantation. And we really only really, uh, move back to the melody when we've got a position. Um, a small conduit or a, a patient circumstance that really requires it. So thanks to all my colleagues, Jenny Zabla, who's really doing most of our high-end work with imaging um, vessel navigator system, and also a phenomenal interventional colleague, Neil Wins Wilson, recently retired, who really was an innovative mentor and really got me moving forward with all these techniques. Our dry seal and non-presenting believers, Evan, Damien, Mario Carmenati in Italy, uh, Jamil and Dan in UCLA, and many, many others throughout the world. And also thanks to coronavirus for ruining everything. Thank you. There we go. So very easily, no pressure at all, mounted valve being passed through the valve of the dry seal. There we go. Well, thank you for those uh, two wonderful, okay, wonderful talks. Um, these uh, speakers uh, need no introduction, as, as you could see, many of them are authors on the papers that were presented, but I still think we should introduce them. Um, the first speaker was uh, Dr. Brian uh, Moray from Seattle Children's Hospital, and then Gareth Morgan uh, talking about sapiens from uh, uh, Children's uh, Hospital of Colorado. Um, I think we have probably a couple of minutes for uh, questions. Let's see, we have a little bit of delay here. So, um, quick question for both of you is, if you can tell us about your program, what is the breakdown between Sapien and Melody, and how do you make that decision? Brian, I want to go to you first, and then Gareth. Sure. Um, We've still been using um, a lot of uh, melody valves, uh, mostly. Uh, most, of our, most of our patients have been, you know, conduit or bioprosthetic valve implantations. Um, and so in that, in that particular instance, you know, there's a good, there's a, a good track record for melody valve implantation. Um, we've been doing far fewer uh, native RVOT uh, implants with balloon expandable valves as we've been sort of moving into the Harmony and the, and the Altera space. Uh, and Evan will discuss that, I think, shortly. Um, so our, our primary go-to valve has been um, using the, the Melody valve, although I will say that with some of the developments and techniques that Gareth and other colleagues have developed using the dry seal sheath, um, we've been moving more towards um, using the S3 valve, uh, particularly in the native position. It really has become a nice, a nice system. Gareth? 
Yeah, I, I suppose it, it depends on your substrate as well. I think it depends on the size of your adult congenital population and the substrate you're working with. We, um, we've, I, I think I've moved towards only using a melody valve when I have to. And when I say have to, I don't like putting 20 millimeter sapien valves into the pulmonary position because I don't think the hemodynamics are good with the 20 valve in the pulmonary position. If it's a 23 size, then I, it, I'm, I'm really sometimes struggle between whether you use a melody and a sapien. But I, despite the fact that data is not conclusive, and I know we're going to have a discussion about it later, but I think the endocarditis data, I think, is in favor of using the Edwards valve, and that's very relevant in the congenital population. And also the ease of implantation of the sapien valve becomes so much better now that um, I mean, we can get these done in 45 minutes with you know as much radiation as you get on a sunny day. So um, we've, we've really moved in, into that as our default, probably 75% sapien, 25% melody. Right. Okay, our next two speakers are um, very well known for pulmonary valves. Uh, the first speaker will be Evan Zahn, who's going to talk about emerging pulmonary valve technology. He uh, leads the cath lab uh, at Cedar sinai And the second speaker will be Doc McElhenney, who uh, runs the cath lab at Stanford. And so we'll look forward to hearing uh, both of their expertise and the two talks coming up. I do have a few disclosures. In terms of percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement development, I think there's a way to divide this into what we would consider at this point tried and true technology, which would include balloon expandable percutaneous valves, such as the Melody valve and the Sapien valve. And what I really consider emerging technologies are those technologies which really are in uh, research clinical trials and soon to be prime time and I'll spend the majority of the talk focused on these and hopefully there'll be a little time at the end to talk about what I consider at this point to be disruptive technology in other words emerging technologies for tomorrow so again let's focus on uh, percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement developments which are emerging now and, and really we've been focused on designing a percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement solution for what we term the large native right ventricular outflow tract. And the focus has been here for some time. Um, all the way back in 2004, um, Philip Bonhoeffer's lab was already beginning to design prototypes, thinking of our large outflow tracts and tetralogy patients, et cetera. And it's remarkable to me that here we are in 2020 and we still haven't gotten there because it turns out that designing a valve solution for these large dilated so-called native outflow tracts is quite a challenge to you. Um, as we speak, there are at least six valves in a variety of clinical trials that were specifically designed to treat these large native outflow tracts. And I'll take you through um, what I think are some of the important similarities and differences of these valves and also where we are right now in terms of state of the art. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at them, they're all shaped somewhat with like an hourglass, meaning that they're flared at the distal or PAN, shown with the blue asterisk. They're also flared at the proximal end. These are primarily for anchoring and stability, and all of them have a somewhat straight central housing uh, to protect the valve leaflets. All of these valves are constructed with self-expanding nitinol frames to contour themselves to these wildly complex outflow. Um, many of the valves, the three listed here, have an open cell pulmonary arterial end uh, meaning there's no covering on the PAN, which I personally think is fairly important. Um, if you look at this 3D model, this happens to be an Altera, but it could be a venous P valve or pulse valve. You can see that we've placed this valve for stability up into the main pulmonary artery. And I think it's important that the distal ends are uncovered. So if you look through, let's say, the orifice of the right pulmonary artery, you can see that there are some bare metal struts crossing that artery, but there's no obstruction to flow to the RPA. And while those are some commonalities, I think it's important to note that there are some very important differences to consider among the current uh, valves designed for the native alpha tract as well. Um, first and most obvious are the sizing considerations. If you look on this list, um, the valve diameters vary greatly all the way from 16 millimeters all the way up to 32 millimeters and pretty much everywhere in between. Some of the manufacturers, such as Pulse to PT and Venus, have decided to make several sizes 
whereas the American companies, Medtronic and Edwards, have stuck more to um, a single size or perhaps two sizes for their valve diameter. Um, the device lengths also vary considerably. I've listed the ones I have, and length turns out to be very important when it comes to patient selection, seating, stability, interference with the branch PAs or infundibulum, etc. Um, turns out that the amount of flaring on the distal end also will be very important in terms of how big an outflow tract you can capture with a particular valve. And finally, um, some of these valves are recapturable and repositionable, uh, a feature which I think as an operator is very advantageous. Um, I think that the fact that all of the valves use slightly different processing on their valve leaflet tissue will raise questions in the future about leaflet performance and durability pulmonic position. I think when one's choosing one of these valves, um, we need to consider what the revalve potential is. In other words, depending on what you start with an initial internal diameter of your valve will determine what things will look like when you revalve, particularly if you're thinking of multiple revalving procedures. Think about as a patient gets older, sort of a, a Russian doll, where you're putting a valve inside a valve inside a valve, and eventually that surface area gets smaller. So I think there's something to consider among the different valves when you're thinking about what inner diameter you'll be implanting. Um, and I, I wanted to sort of conclude this part by just updating you as to where the various valves are. The venous P valve uh, was among the first to be tested in humans, has had extensive implantation, hundreds of patients in a Chinese clinical trial, which is completing. And the Chinese FDA is reviewing the data, and there's an expectation of approval in that country uh, in 2021. The Harmony valve for Medtronic initially began with the Harmony 22, um, that was one of the first or the first uh, early feasibility trial in the United States. That trial has completed. There was then a redesign of the valve uh, with the Harmony 25, a larger valve. And I understand from the investigators, there is a possibility of FDA approval as early as 2021 in the United States. The Pulsed valve has completed its evaluation and is approved for commercial use in its native country of Korea. And the Altera Prestent and Sapien valve in the U.S., we've completed our early feasibility. Pivotal enrollment will com be completed uh, by mid-July this month. And continued access is planned for 2021 as the FDA reviews the data. And we would hope for U.S. approval sometime shortly after that. And finally, the PT valve, the newest valve on the block, is undergoing preclinical trial, which has been completed in China, and a large Chinese multicenter trial is beginning now. But what really excites me is perhaps what's coming next. Um, the next several slides were lent to me by some really innovative colleagues. This is Mario Carminati, um, who's really one of the leaders of our field. He works in San Donato, which is in Milano, Italy. And Mario and his team have done some really uh, exciting work with advanced predictive modeling for the sole purpose of improving transcatheter pulmonary valve technology. Lots of us use 3D physical models, but what Mario has done is he's married the technology used to make 3D physical models to 3D computational modeling and finite element analysis and is now able through a relatively simple technologies like CT scan to mimic uh, to a large degree, what will happen with valve surrounding tissue implantation, the hope being able to predict um, what a certain implant would look like. So this, for instance, is a patient's CT scan with a computational model of what it would look like with a Melody pre-stent going in. And what they're looking at here is what would happen to the calcium deposits and would it be safe. But in that same vein, they've taken this a step further and begun to look at can we predict coronary compression, very important for balloon expandable valves such as the Melody and Sapien valve. And here's a patient's computational model and his real live catheterization. And you can see that in the computational model, they nicely predict that you are gonna have important compression of the uh, left that'll only get better uh, in the near term. And finally, I'd like to wrap up with some really exciting work that our friends at Nationwide have been doing, led by Amy Armstrong, 
Um, Amy and her group have been looking at tissue engineered heart valves and fetal implantation of transcatheter uh, heart valves in the pulmonic position. I'd like to thank Amy um, for loaning me these slides. Um, this is a busy slide, but, it, but in one sort of fell swoop summarizes what their work has been doing. Um, basically, they are looking at a dissolvable stent and a tissue scaffolding that can be implanted into a fetal uh, animal model and then uh, with absorption of the stent and seating of the scaffold develop a, a homegrown, if you will, uh, lifelong tissue. Remarkably, they're able to crimp this down where it fits through a 17 gauge cannula and with that cannula they've been able to do some fetal implants. This is a fetal sheep and you can clearly see the stent uh, on FOSS and also longitude. Um, this is a picture of that fetal sheep once it's been delivered. And so in conclusion, I'd like to wrap up by saying, in my opinion, the emerging percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement technology in the near term is this really remarkable variety of self-expanding uh, valves, which are really been designed for the large native valve tract and are currently finishing up clinical trials. And I expect to have in the next two to five years, a wide range of tools in my cath lab to be able to treat these patients. In terms of midterm uh, emerging technology. I really think that computational modeling, there are many other groups working similar to Mario's group and doing phenomenal works, which I think will be commercially available also within the next two to three years and really helpful for planning these complex procedure. And then perhaps a little longer term is some of the work that Amy and others are doing, particularly notable is some of the work coming out of Germany with tissue engineered transcatheter implantable valves. I didn't have time to talk about it, but there are some excellent labs looking at bioprinted valves and valve materials. And then finally, I don't think it's far off where, we're, where we will be able to realistically think about fetal valve implantation therapy. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. The title I was given for this talk is Percutaneous PVR Endocarditis, Signal or Noise. I like this framework for considering the issue of endocarditis after transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement because it is built around the differentiation between signal, which I think of as data that accurately reflect and provide insight into the process or issue of concern, and noise, or information that obscures or confuses insight into that issue. With regard to the current topic, percutaneous PVR endocarditis, it is clear that we're de dealing with both signal and noise, which can be evaluated in terms of specific data about this issue, as well as the context in which those data occur and how they are interpreted. So let's start out by looking at the signal. One of the most important aspects of this issue is the context around the patient population. Specifically, one of the clearest facts is that patients who tend to undergo transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement are at the highest baseline risk of endocarditis among any patients with congenital heart disease. In this series out of the Netherlands, patients with complex conotruncal anomalies, particularly pulmonary atresia with VSD, were at especially high risk of developing endocarditis. Moreover, compared to patients with no prosthetic material or non-valvar prosthetic material, those with valve-containing prosthetic material were at substantially higher risk of developing endocarditis. Using a risk score they developed, uh, the investigators suggested that patients with pulmonary atresia VSD, a valve-containing prosthesis, and a prior history of endocarditis had a 12% risk of endocarditis at 10 years and a 7% risk at 5 years. Now, when I first read this next paper, which reports data from the STS registry, I was somewhat surprised to learn that 12% of adults undergoing surgical pulmonary valve replacement had a prior history of endocarditis, and that number was even higher among patients undergoing concomitant procedures. Those percentages in a cohort that more or less reflects the target, target population for TPVR are quite high, which has clear implications for subsequent endocarditis risk. In another study published in the European Heart Journal that looked at nationwide hospitalization data in England, patients with a prior history of endocarditis, a prosthetic valve replacement or repair, or congenital heart disease with cyanosis or a prosthetic conduit were at dramatically higher risk than all other patients, both for developing endocarditis and dying from it. Now there's quite a bit more literature that supports this fundamental contextual truth which is that the de demographic of patients who undergo transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement are at very high baseline risk for endocarditis even before a transcatheter valve is placed. 
That context is obviously critical. When it comes to data about TPVR procedures, there is also a clear signal that patients who undergo a transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement can and do indeed develop endocarditis. In fact, the first case of endocarditis after transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement was first reported by Bonhoeffer's group in their 2005 article that included their first 59 patients. By the time of their next article in 2008, which reported on 155 patients, they had observed endocarditis in five patients. Indeed, a number of subsequent studies have documented evidence of endocarditis after TPVR. In this report, which included 309 patients who were followed prospectively for over 1,600 patient years as part of three melody valve trials, the incidence of endocarditis was about 3.1% per patient year, and of endocarditis involving the valve, 2.4% per patient year. At five years post-implant, freedom from a diagnosis of endocarditis was 89%, freedom from valve-related endocarditis was 92%, and freedom from RVOT reintervention for endocarditis was 96%. There are a number of other studies that support this signal. The clearest data we have about endocarditis after TPVR using sapien valves can be found in the instructions for use submitted to the FDA as part of the approval process, which demonstrated a five-year freedom from endocarditis after sapien valve implant of 86% in their cohort of 69 implants. Another important signal in this space, in this case derived from the collective literature on endocarditis after TPVR, is that approximately half of patients who are diagnosed with endocarditis are treated medically without invasive therapy. So as you can see, there's plenty of signal related to this issue, but there's also plenty of noise. Starting again with context, one of the most important sources of noise is the literature on RV to PA conduits, which provides very little insight into the incidence of endocarditis after conduit replacement. As you recall from one of the earlier slides, 12% of adults undergoing surgical pulmonary valve replacement had a prior history of endocarditis. In the literature on outcomes of RV to PA conduits or bioprosthetic valves in the pulmonary position, there are relatively few reported cases of endocarditis. The reason for this is not entirely transparent, but most of these series were surgical and focused on reintervention, so cases of endocarditis were only ascertained when they were direct indications for reoperation. That same limitation afflicts this so-called systematic review, which compared endocarditis in patients with different types of RVOT conduit or valve. While the cases of endocarditis after melody valve placement in this review may be accurate, it is likely that the data on homografts and bioprosthetic valves was not, as essentially all of the cases identified in those groups were treated surgically. In other words, they were almost certainly cases of medically treated endocarditis that were not ascertained, and as a result, the reported incidence of endocarditis was likely underestimated, suggesting a greater disparity compared to transcatheter valves. Another source of noise concerning endocarditis after transcatheter pulmonary valve replacement can be found in the literature on this topic. Notably, a substantial number of reported cases are duplicates. For example, in this review of articles published through 2016, about 20% of cases of endocarditis that were reported after melody valve implant in 24 articles were duplicates, meaning that they were reported in multiple publications. That source of noise is even more pronounced today, as there are more single and multi-stunter studies out there. For instance, I am aware of single cases that have been included in as many as five different articles. While there's nothing wrong with including patients in multiple reports, sometimes in a single center report, then a multi-center series, sometimes in follow-up studies after an earlier report, if it is not clearly acknowledged that cases may duplicate prior reports, it can create a false impression that the cases are unique, fostering a notion that there are more cases than there actually are. It should also be recognized that some reports introduce noise as a result of publication bias or a non-representative experience. More extreme circumstances are likely to be reported, whereas experiences with few events are less likely to be published. For example, this relatively early four-case series by the group in Paris, which was alarming, does not reflect any other published experience and is notable for questionable patient selection, with TPVR performed in patients with very small, non-expandable conduits that would not be considered suitable implant environments in current practice. But that is not necessarily what people see when they look at this paper. It is potentially misleading. 
Similarly, in this small single center series, the authors concluded, based on analysis that was flawed in many ways, that endocarditis was more common after melody valve TPVR than after sapien valve implant. If you look at the data, however, you see that the entire difference is the result of endocarditis in six of their first 19 implants, which is higher than any other reported experience and seems to have a center-specific intensity. Now, there were other methodologic problems that I'm not mentioning here, but the point is that that sample was biased and the conclusions, conclusions premature, yet the paper was still accepted for publication in Jack Interventions, and that constitutes some degree of noise that confounds this issue. This is also reflected in the literature, where definitions and criteria are not always clear. The diagnosis of endocarditis involving a transcatheter pulmonary valve is not always straightforward. For example, the diagnostic criteria for endocarditis are not necessarily well suited for right-sided involvement, and patients with congenital heart disease, fever, and positive blood cultures automatically meet criteria for possible endocarditis. Thus, patients with a TPV who are characterized as having endocarditis may not actually have valvar involvement. And this source of noise is compounded by the fact that transthoracic and transesophageal echo are not very good for identifying pulmonary valve involvement. And finally, I would like to point out that the matter in which uh, the issue is framed can confound our understanding of the data and what it says about the phenomenon of endocarditis. For example, in this series of patients who underwent RVO reconstruction with a homograft or contegra, the authors observed that freedom from RVO Re RVOT reintervention was better with a contegra valve than with a homograft, but the incidence of endocarditis was higher. Thus, even though the contegra performed better and lasted longer than homographs, the authors concluded this paper by acknowledging that, based on these findings, they've changed their practice to decrease the use of contegras in favor of other conduit types. They decreased their use of the valve that performed better overall because it was more likely to become infected. That is an irrational decision, theirs to make, of course but it seems to imply that endocarditis is somehow uniquely problematic. In summary, there is both signal and noise around the issue of percutaneous pulmonary valve replacement endocarditis. It is real, but patients who receive a transcatheter valve are at very high risk regardless. Endocarditis is not unique to one particular RVOP prosthesis type um, or among tr transcatheter valves, um, but there are likely unique aspects to different implants that we need to understand better. About half of reported cases are treated successfully with medical therapy alone, um, and there is definitely noise in the system. The literature on the topic is not always straightforward for a variety of reasons, and the interpretation of that literature um, more broadly can also uh, be somewhat confounding. The, this is a lifetime management issue, um, and the lifetime management of RVOT disease is not a single issue proposition. We need to look at the entire picture and that includes both signal and noise. Thank you very much. So thanks everyone for those great talks. Um, I, after the procedure leads to a higher rate of endocarditis. And so do you think that with the melody valve versus sapien valve, part of it is related to the residual gradient using a smaller valve, or do you think it's the valve type itself? Ivan, do you want to take that one? Hi, Man. Um, you are on. Hi, Doc. How are yeah, you? No, good, good. Yeah, I think it's it's a little bit more complicated because if you look at the patients who are receiving sapiens um, and those who receive melodies, it's there's overlap obviously in the RVOT anatomy, but uh, it's not exactly the same. So I think yes, it, residual gradient or gradient seems to be implants as well as different types of outflow tracts into which uh, the valves are are implanted. So honestly, we don't know enough about the sapien valve and endocarditis yet. There's very little long-term data out there, um, very little published um, that sheds much light on it. I uh, set of data that were out there, which were from the ISU, but that was 69 implants. So I think we're just not there yet in terms of understanding this issue with respect to the sapien valve or more broadly. Um, and I think it's going to be really pretty complicated, no matter what, difficult to identify strong, clear, definitive predictors. So half an answer there, I guess. Then one other question about endocarditis. We've had a several adult patients who've had a lot of pulmonary valve dysfunction as a result of pulmonary valve endocarditis. And then in terms of... So I guess there's acute phase um, and then there's subacute or chronic. And some patients who develop endocarditis acutely have uh, increased gradient. Uh, there's occasional acute pulmonary regurgitation, but more often it's a stance. Often what you'll find is if you treat those 
patients medically and they get through it, that obstruction actually resolves or improves. And then in a, some number of patients, we do see um, longer term or you know, sort of subacute put another valve into those patients is sort of the same as the question about whether to put one into a patient who's had prior conduit and on the organisms as well. Some Staph aureus is much more virulent than some of the has, uh, some of the Hasek organisms or viridens group strep, for example. So again, still working this out, but I, I certainly wouldn't say definitively do not do it because it has been done in a number of cases and there are patients out many, many years after a secondary valve and valve, transcatheter valve implanted for endocarditis. Numbers are small, but it's, I don't think there's an absolute um, uh, always or never sort of answer in that situation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dov. Thank you, all the speakers. It's been a wonderful session. I want to say thank you to Edwards Life Sciences for sponsoring this uh, ACTI Symposium, um, first one um, in CBI, and hope to see all of you next year. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody.